In Matthew's Gospel in chapter 22, it says here at uh, verse 34, But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Now last week we started out into this, uh, this series with this statement. This, the question comes to Jesus. This happens during this week, these few days just before he's arrested and, and goes to the cross. He's being interviewed over and over again by Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, in the public places, and here comes one of them to ask him this question. It's a difficult question because there's hundreds of commandments which rabbis are teaching routinely. And how in the world can you say which one's the best? But Jesus says, listen, if you want to know what it all hinges on, here it is. You shall love the Lord your God with everything, all. Bring it all, everything about you, all of you, because he, he is our all in all. He is the Lord God Almighty, and we give him our all. It's got quiet out here all of a sudden. You know, we like the alls when they come our way. He forgiveth all your iniquities. Yes. <laughs> he healeth all your diseases. Yes. When it says, and all he wants is all of me, it's like, oh, whoa, 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 slow down. Let's not be hasty. We like the alls when they work for us, but sometimes the alls are demanded of us. And th- this isn't the kind of thing where we can kind of be half in, half out, toes in the water, I'm okay, I'll just do a little wading, you people swim. <laughs> if we're going to do this with God, we're, we've got to be all in, and he's calling for all. And then Jesus, he, he says, listen, it's, it's more than that. There's a second one which gives us some perspective on that. You need to love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, on these two commandments, these two statements, the whole of the scriptures hangs. All of the law and the prophets, everything that's been written is hanging on these two concepts. And really, they're one concept in two expressions, if I can say that. Because loving the Lord my God with everything that's in me is going to cause me to love my neighbor as myself, because that's what God does. God so loved the world that he gave. And if I'm going to love him the way that he loves me, I'm going to love what he loves. And if he loves the world, I'm going to find myself loving the world. This is getting... Are you guys still awake? So, um, with, with that said, last week I pointed out that when he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all... That's a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 6. That's something which was intensely familiar to everybody who had an experience in synagogue or temple. Everybody for for Jews for literally 3,500 years, wherever there's Jews, if you start talking about that, they know exactly what you're referencing. In the same way that people who have spent time hanging around churches somewhere will recognize what you're talking about if you say, our Father who art in heaven. In fact, you're beginning to say the rest of it already without me even prompting you. If I said, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive our, those who trespass against us, you would, most of you immediately are connecting what the rest of it is. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know what I'm talking about, right? Now, we have different levels of experience with that, different levels. Some of us can recite the whole thing beginning to end, backward and forward, pick it up in the middle and go on from there. Others of us are like, well, I think, what's that? Isn't that that thing they call the Lord's Prayer? Yeah, that's what that is. But if you, if you spend any time hanging around English-speaking churches, you're going to hear that somewhere, sometime, right? And it becomes a part of your experience. Well, to the Jewish world, this brief statement in Deuteronomy chapter 6 carries that kind of weight. And when Jesus says it, everybody within his hearing immediately knows the whole story of what Deuteronomy 6 is saying because it's a prayer which devout Jews the world over have prayed morning and evening, twice a day, for literally 3,500 years, give or take a few. That's a long time. It's getting quiet out here. And so it's what we would call culturally ingrained. 
And what that that but he he takes it to a next level because he doesn't continue into Deuteronomy chapter six. He talks about Le- Leviticus chapter nineteen, and it's like, well, why would you park the second part in Leviticus chapter nineteen? But he's he's showing us that these scriptures are speaking together to show us the heart of God. Yes. And that loving God manifests itself in the way that I live my life. It isn't just something that I do quietly, religiously, devotionally, out of sight, and privately. But that the way I live my life is going to demonstrate that I love God. And how I conduct myself towards others is going to demonstrate that I love God. And in fact, as John would say in 1 John, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, if, if you say that you love God but your behavior doesn't show it, I think you're lying (laughs) and say that's a terrible thing for you to say pastor it's I was just referencing what John said John said that in first John it's got quiet out there he said "We, we, we don't want to well that's okay so the prayer in Deuteronomy chapter 6 which is what we started with last week yes and uh let's go read that together in Deuteronomy chapter 6 It says in verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart. And then he goes on to say you talk about them. You talk about them with your children. You teach them to your children. You speak about them in your house. You speak about them when you sit down. You speak about them when you stand up. You just work them into your day. You routinely work this into your day. You remind yourself all the time of this truth. And it begins with that statement, hear, O Israel. And we were talking last week about listening to obey, the way that we hear, what we hear. Because both Old Testament and New, we see over and over and over again these references to hearing. And so many of the prophets speak about they've got ears but they're not listening they've got eyes but they're not seeing and then Jesus comes along saying very much the same sort of thing and concluding so often with that statement he who has ears to hear let him hear well we recognize almost everybody he's speaking to has an ear on each side of their head but he's talking about something other than the physical functioning of our ears he's talking about are you listening are you hearing is are you paying attention are you awake and engaged and so, Hero Israel isn't simply a, yeah, Hero Israel. Yeah, yeah. It's, are you listening? It's a way of saying to yourself every morning and every evening, wake up and pay attention. The Lord is God, He's one. And, and that, that next part of that statement is, is where I want to spend a little bit of time as we get started here this morning. The Lord is our God, the Lord is is one. There's a number of different ways that that could be translated, and and they all are very closely related to each other, but uh, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. And we're taking, well, there's all, there's, oh man, if I were a Hebrew expert, I might be tempted to do a big Hebrew lesson, but then that would be sad for all of us. So I'm, I'm not going to do a big Hebrew lesson, and I'm not a Hebrew expert, but I will point out that there are a bunch of different words in the Old Testament which, come, which, which we render something like God. And so when we see things like Lord and God, they look kind of the same to us. They're not always, even when you see the same English word, it isn't always a translation of the same Hebrew word. And there's a lot of different ways of saying this. But what we're, we're, we're calling in here. God is identifying himself by the most personal name that he has given as a revelation of himself. See, there's, there's a word for God, which we, like with a small g, like the gods of the Greeks, the gods of the Romans, the gods of the who's and the them's and the those. There's, we talk about gods, but there's a word for God. But so you say, so we also talk about God in heaven. Well, but he's the God, not a God. We're using the same word, but we're using it differently, right? And it, it's not uncommon to find the same situation here in, in the Hebrew, where we've got one word. There's a word in the Hebrew which describes Lord, which describes somebody who's a ruler or a sovereign, your boss, your owner, whatever, and it's describing your king. But then there's also a way that we modify that word a little bit, and it becomes almighty. And it suggests not just a ruler or sovereign, but the ruler or sovereign, the big one, 
the one who has all of that potency. Are, are you awake? That's the, the Shaddai, El Shaddai. He's the God Almighty. He's, uh, and uh, W.E. Vine says of Shaddai that it, the title Shaddai really indicates the fullness and riches of God's grace and would remind the Hebrew reader that from God comes every good and perfect gift, that he is never weary of pouring forth his mercies on his people, and that he is more ready to give than they are to receive. A suggested synonym is bountiful. We're talking about somebody who's got resources and capability. That's what Almighty is suggesting to us. That his lordship is one which is because of his tremendous ability. Are we still here? But as he comes to them, he says, he gives them the name by which he's called himself towards them. As I say, his most personal name. And you say, well, why aren't you just telling us what it is? Well, there's this huge controversy over what, how we ought to bother to pronounce this, whether we ought to bother to pronounce this. I've got no problems about trying to pronounce it. It's just that no matter which one I choose, somebody's going to say, aha, he picked the wrong one. <laughs> And, and whether we want to go with Jehovah or Yehovah or whether we want to go with Yahweh or Yahweh or some other variation of those, the point of the story is this. It's what, what, are you ready for scholarship stuff? We call it the Tetragrammaton. It's four letters with no vowels. And without the vowels, you don't know how to pronounce it. And so Hebrews, when they're reading it, they insert the word Adonai in its place and say that instead. If they're praying or reading from the scriptures aloud, they put the word Adonai, which in the Hebrew is, is uh, another one of the words that we use for God. But it, in common speech, if we're just talking, we don't generally say Adonai when we wanted to say the Lord. We say, well, Hashem. But I said we weren't going to have a Hebrew lesson, and we're not, because I'm not, I'm not capable of giving you a Hebrew lesson, so we're not going to do that. But you're saying, where in the world is all this going? I really don't want to be speaking Hebrew when we leave here, Pastor. Let's not. <laughs> Let's simply understand this, that in revealing himself, God uses this word when he's asked who he is, how to identify him, he identifies himself towards his people with a word which is connected to the word for being, to be. And it suggests he is who was and is and ever will be. His name kind of says, I've been, I am, I will be. And whenever it's said, that's who he is. And if we could maybe take that one, I am, I, 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 I've been, I am, I will be. What it says to us here is, I am, I've been, I will be, is our God. Where you might want to use a small g for God, because everybody we know has a God. But our God is I am, I've been, I will be. This is who our God is. So that statement, which seems a little redundant in the English, the Lord our God, the Lord is our God, he's saying, I didn't mention, I probably should have mentioned, typical English convention for the name of God is that we translate it as Lord with all capitals. That's not always the case, but usually the case. So when you run across Lord in all capitals, you're usually talking about the Lord our God. Yes? Everybody's got a God, but this is the one who says he's our God. And there's those people whose God is, is the God of the corn harvest, and they've got some things. There's those people whose God is this and God is that, but this one who says, I was and I am and I will be. This one who says, I don't need any other identifier, I just am that I am. I exist because I exist. And I don't need anybody else or anything else to make me exist. I'm not defined in relationship to anything, but everything is defined in relationship to me. 
That's the bold statement here. It says, listen to this, Israel. Listen to this and get your head in, aligned with this. Start your day remembering this. Close your eyes at night remembering this. The Lord God Almighty, the God of heaven who made everything, who's always been and always will be, is the one who is your God. you got people all around you who worship all kinds of things, knowingly and unknowingly, but your God is the God. And that's worth knowing. And then, just in case we're missing the point, he says, he is one. This is not a statement of uh, Trinitarian or Unitarian theology. It's a statement of the fact that God, in all of his diverse manifestations, in all of the different ways he reveals himself to us, in all of the different things that he does with us and for us and through us, he's one. Because people made their gods, their little g gods, into very small two-dimensional beings who had just one-track minds. Are, are you home? So if there's thunder and lightning going on, that's an angry god. That's not... But, but if the sun is shining, that's a happy god. We've got two gods, a happy god and an angry god. When it's raining, we've got a rainy god. When it's dry, we've got a dry God. We're not saying there is one God who does different things. We're saying everything that happens, there's a God for. Every single type of of personality, every single type of of, of blessing, every single type gets its own God. And we've seen this kind of thing, right? Where people have this incredible list of gods. This is the God of, you know, tulips that bloom in April. This is the God of tulips that bloom in May. It's like, all right. Because everything that happens, there has to be somebody who's on top of that and only cares about that and only pays attention to that to the point where you've got the God who lives in the dead tree down by the bend in the river. That's his turf. You get near there, he's the boss. But you get out of sight, he's not got any power anymore because he's in the dead tree down by the bend in the river. Are we with me? But our God... This God who was and is and will be. This God who exists without anybody having to make Him exist. This God whose whole being is expressed in all of creation is one. He's not one among gods who compete for our attention and our authority. He is God. And this statement right up front, this is who we're talking about. We're talking about the Lord God Almighty, and He's one. He's, it's not that there's different gods for me to entreat depending on what I need. There's not different gods for me to entreat depending on what kind of mood I'm hoping to catch Him in. I'm not supposed to be considering God to be fashioned in my image. I'm supposed to be understanding that God stands outside of my thinking, outside of my image, outside of the little box that my brain wants to put Him in, and He is what He is. And he's got capability which is vast. And he doesn't have to be a different God to do something other than what I've seen him do. He can be the same God and be bigger than what I've seen. He can be the same God who is, he, he not only, he can meet with me here this morning and move me to tears and be speaking to somebody in the Philippines and answering a prayer in South Africa all at the same time, and it doesn't phase him at all. We don't need three gods to get those three jobs done. We don't need one God who answers prayer and another God who overlooks us and another God who handles protection and another God who leads us and another. We don't need a bunch. We got one God who does it all. He's the whole deal. One complete God. And that's this statement which is so easy to just move across like it's nothing. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. It's a, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a powerful statement and it's designed to focus the attention of Israel. The cry is, listen to this Israel. Listen to this to obey. Listen to this to take to heart. Listen to this to pay attention to. The Lord is our God. And He's one. Everything about the Lord is just the Lord, the one Lord to whom we refer. Is there an amen in there? 
And so that's who, and that's what the, the Lord, which I told you is the common English translation of it, so I'm going to stick with that a little bit here. The Lord is what Abraham called him. It's what Moses called him. It's how he's chosen to be called over time. He's the Lord. And, and in revealing himself, in, uh, let's go to Exodus chapter 3 for a moment. Is God on the job? Say, what does all this have to do with my day today? We need to know, just as folks needed to know then, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. I don't need a different God for different needs. I've got one God who is sufficient for all needs. There is nothing I need, nothing that is required to satisfy me that is not going to be found in Him. Now, I'm not telling you I haven't looked in other places. I've looked in a lot of other places. But I can tell you there is nothing that I need. There is nothing that is required to satisfy me that isn't found in Him. Because the Lord our God is one. And that is a powerful statement. Back here in, in Exodus chapter 3, when... Moses encounters God in this burning bush, and some of you will have some familiarity with this story. Moses is just walking home from work one day, and he looks over and he sees a bush which looks like it's on fire, but it doesn't seem to be being burned. And he wanders over to it. Now, whether he wanders over because it looks interesting and he's wondering what's going on, or whether he wanders over to it because he doesn't want to see a fire get started in the brush out here, and he's, he's wondering what's going on, we don't know exactly what his motivation is, but as he approaches, as he comes near to the bush, God calls out to him from the bush. And he says, Moses says, whoa, yeah. And God starts to speak to him. I've seen what's happening here. My people's cry has come to my ears. I've heard what they've said. And it's time to deliver them. And I'm going to send you. But then Moses has a request here at verse 13 in chapter 3. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? He says, I've encountered a God in the desert who says He's going to deliver us. And they may say to me, who's that? And he's saying, and then what do I say? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, I shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord there we are with the all caps Lord again, right? The Lord, the name that I revealed myself to Abraham under, the name that I've revealed myself to your forefathers under. The Lord, the God, and when we say God there, we're using the kind of a God that we would use with a small g to talk about everybody's got a God. I'm the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me, you Moses, to me. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. He's identified himself. He says, I'm the Lord. It's me. Abraham knew me. Isaac knew me. Jacob knew me. Now you know me, Moses. You tell them that's who sent you. You tell them to wake up. The Lord is their God. And he is one. Amen? Now, what is the, the response that we're called to have to this God back here in Deuteronomy chapter 6? You don't have to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6, but what did it say there? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God. You shall love. Why do we love? Well, we understand. That's what leaders always want, right? Devotion, love. That's what they're always asking for. That's, no, it's not the love that the king demands. The situation here is this. There is nothing more characteristic of the Lord than his love. Let me say that again. There is nothing more characteristic of the Lord than his love. So much so that the, the scripture tells us in 1 John, God is love. 
So much so that when we're listing the fruit of the Holy Spirit's activity in our lives, the first thing on the list is love. And it's been suggested by many commentators that the rest of the list is really just amplifying what love means. That the other love, joy, peace, that stuff is all part of what love is about. It's if you shined love into a prism and it broke down into its component pieces, you would see what happens when we shine light into a prism. We see blue and green and red and yellow, but when it's all together, we call it white light, light. And it says, there are those who suggest that that's largely what's happening with the fruit of the Spirit, that if you take love and shine it through a prism, what you see is joy and peace and long-suffering. But love really describes them all. Love encompasses all of them. Love, and whether you want to identify with that or not is going to be your choice, but love is certainly at the top of the list. Love is first on the list. Love is not just what God does, it's who God is. God is love, and the fruit of His Spirit is love. And because love is so intensely characteristic of Him, love is what we give back to Him. It's not just the devotion that a subject gives to their ruler, it's a response to Him, His nature moves me towards love. And I'm supposed to recognize that His nature, His love nature, is so powerful that it calls for love from me. So much so that, and we, we saw Jesus, Jesus quotes from Leviticus 19 when He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, right? In the Hebrew, we're using exactly the same word for love your neighbor that we're losing, using for love the Lord your God. I'm supposed to love God, and the love of God in me is supposed to love other folks. Is that making some sense to you? And in fact, that, that begins to sound a good deal like the New Testament, doesn't it? Don't we keep encountering that concept over and over here? Particularly, I imagine you're already thinking of uh, uh, John's Gospel, chapter 13, where Jesus is, is teaching his disciples, and he says to them, at verse 35, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. People have heard that who couldn't give, couldn't give you a wild guess where to find it. But people have heard it. How shall they know that we're his disciples? By the love that we have one to another. Jesus is saying, listen, this is going to be different than what people have seen and experienced. People think they know what it's like to be fond of people, to get along with people, to care about people, to live in covenant, to have a social covenant together, to, to a people together, to, to be of a tribe. They think they know what these things mean, but it's going to be different with you. There's going to be something which is going to happen because of the Holy Spirit who's coming to you. And as he does, something, that, something about the dynamic, the way that you all work together is going to be so different, people are going to see it, and they're going to know that you're my disciples because of the way that you walk out covenant together, because of the way that you care for each other, because of the way that you desire to serve and to bless each other. There's going to be something about that. I'm headed over to 1 John, and I'm going to read you some here in 1 John in just a moment, but I, I need to say something here before we get started into 1 John. Um, probably chapter 4, I think, is where we'll begin, so you can get there if you'd like to. But love, it's, it's, very, it's virtually impossible to separate the word love from serve. Now, you can serve without love, but you can't love without serving. <laughs> it's got quiet. You can serve without love. And a great many people serve out of fear. As we say, a great many people serve out of fear. Uh, you see, that's why the Scripture tells us how are we supposed to do our work heartily as unto the Lord. What, what is that telling me? It's telling me that I can enter into the service that I give in this life because of love. But if you look around next time you go to work you will pretty quickly identify, if you pay attention, that most of the people you're looking at are not here because of love. They're here because of fear. So they don't look that afraid. Well, they're afraid of starving if they don't do this job. They're afraid of losing their stuff if they don't bring home a check at the end of the week. And if it weren't for that, they'd be out of here like... Oh, you're all looking at me strangely. You know, most of us have worked somewhere 
at some point in our lives where somebody, you just had the feeling you couldn't get them out of here with a stick of dynamite. They could retire, they'd still be here. They could quit paying them, they'd still be here. I mean, this, this, they, they love this. This is their life. This is what they want to do. Have we worked with somebody like that somewhere in your lifetime? i got like six of you. I've seen more than one person like that in my life where you just had the feeling that they would come without pay, they would come without, they would crawl if they had to just to be here and do this. This is what they live for. But that's not been the experience. I mean, when I say I've met a fistful of people, I've worked with hundreds of people in my life, hundreds and hundreds of people in my life, and a fistful of them fit that description. The rest of them, the other 99 point something percent of them, were there because they were afraid of what would happen if they weren't there. Not because they loved to be there. Their love of nothing was moving them to be there. Their fear of something was moving them to be there. You're, you're getting quiet on me all of a sudden. Say, where are you going with all this love-fear stuff, Pastor? Well, it's very simply this. We think of fear as a powerful motivator. We think of fear as a strong motivator. And it, it can be, but the problem with fear is that it's not always there. And when things get difficult, when hardship comes, when things don't work well, people who serve out of fear quit and run. But when somebody is serving out of love, their desire to bless the object of their love is strong enough to carry them through untold hardship and to stay by their side. We see that in the story of Ruth and Naomi, where she said, it's like, I don't care if this kills us both, I'm going with you. This isn't about making myself happy. This isn't about pleasing me. This isn't about what I need or want. And I'm not with you because I'm afraid of what will happen if I'm not. I'm with you because I love you. I'm committed to you. I'm going to stand with you. And nothing is going to drive me off of that. And when we love the Lord our God, we are in a much better place to, to be what we've been called to be than when we simply say, I'm afraid of what will happen if I don't do this. The service that we want to bring, and I was just reflecting, Father's Day 1984 was the first time I ever gave a message on a Sunday morning in front of a congregation. I was asked to speak. Sunday morning, Father's Day, I don't remember which day in June that was, but you could guess, I mean, it's not hard. Calculator, computer makes it easy these days. But whatever day that was, message was real simple. I talked about sons who serve and talked about the old covenant and the call to service. But then I talked about sons who, excuse me, I said that wrong. I talked about servants of God. The Old Covenant and coming into service to God. Then I talked about sons who serve. Excuse me, I jumped it again. Whew. Servants of God, sons of God. That's a step up. But the place that I wanted to land, the place that I was aiming for in that message, the place that I have continued to want to be in my life is the son who serves. Because it's better to be a son than a servant but it's best to be a son who serves, whose love moves him to serve, who's, who says, that my father loves me. I've got a place at his table. I've got an inheritance in this house. I don't have to do anything, but my love makes me want to serve. I don't serve because I'm afraid that I won't get fed if I don't serve. I don't serve because I'm afraid that I won't be housed if I don't serve. I serve because I want to serve. It's what's in me. I love to do this. In the same way that my father lo so loves that he gives and he serves and he blesses, his love shed abroad in my heart has made me so that I so love, that I serve and I bless. There was a day in my life when if you'd asked me, was I capable of keeping covenant, if I was going to be honest, I would have had to say, yeah, I would like to think so. I mean, I try hard to be committed to things and to do things by principle, but you know, when push comes to shove, it seems like what I end up choosing all the time is me. You know, I, I, want, to, I want to bless you, I want to love you, but if it comes down to you or me, me keeps winning. 
But I have increasingly had the love of God moving in me to where I'm becoming increasingly faithful to covenant, increasingly able to say, you know what? I serve and I bless even when it costs me more than I want it to. Even when it costs me more than I'm comfortable with. I serve and I bless because it's who I am, not because it's convenient or easy. And I do it regardless of what other types of pressures there are. Hardship doesn't make me quit and run. Hardship doesn't force me off of my place. Hardship does not move me away from my covenantal commitments. The love which God is works through me to accomplish His good pleasure. Is that making some sense to you? In I said chapter 4 of 1 John. I'll come to chapter 4, but I'm going to read you two different things. Three, first, verse 3. Chapter 3, there we go. Chapter 3 of 1 John says at verse 11, For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And then he comes down to verse 14 and he says, We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. How is it that I know that I'm born again? How is it that I know that I'm born of the Spirit of God? How is it that I can testify that I have been redeemed? Is that simply a theological position that I adopt? How do I know this? And John is telling us one way that I know this. I know this by the earnest of the Spirit. John tells me in chapter 4, because of the Holy Spirit I know that I, these things are true. But what is one evidence? Because I love the brethren. Because there is a covenant between me and people that I would not have entered into a covenant with if it was all about me. Because I'm willing to give from myself and from the things that that I think are mine in order to bless others, because I'm willing to sacrifice resources and 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 and, and, and you know time, effort, strength, all of it for somebody, that becomes to me an evidence staring at me and screaming, you're not doing this to try to be accepted by God. You're doing the This is evidence that the Holy Spirit we're reading about is actually in you changing things here, John. Because I remember John when John didn't want to do anything for anybody unless it made him look good. When there was always some angle that was serving John in everything that John did. There was nothing even slightly altruistic about John. Most of you didn't know John then, but you're glad that you didn't. He was not an unpleasant person. He was not worse than most people, but he was an extremely self-centered person. He, he knew what it was to be all about me. Are you guys still awake? So we come to chapter 4. And he says to us at verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God, and knows God. So there we have the, the, the bold statement. Love comes from God. When, when I allow that love, which Romans chapter 5 tells me is shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit, poured out the way you dump out a bucket. I dumped out a mop bucket the other day. I just, and I, I, I won't, to tell you the truth, I didn't, it was, it was full of sand and grit and stuff that I'd cleaned up from somewhere, and I didn't want to have to rinse the bucket thoroughly. So I dumped it with an effort to get everything out on the first try. Nobody but me, huh? <laughs> I didn't want to just pour it out, and then, and then I just, boom, it's gone. Got it all out in one try. That's what it says in the scriptures when he says poured out. He's talking about dumped out the way you dump out a bucket. Not a little bit at a time, but just flip it over and let it go. The love of God is poured out like a flash flood in my heart. And when I receive that, when I hear that, when I respond to what the Spirit is doing in there, I begin to show this love out here. That love is from God. That is the testimony that God is working in me by His Spirit. And that God things are happening now that wouldn't have been if they weren't. The Lord is my God. He is one. And I will love Him because He's loved me. I'm going to read on a little bit here into into chapter 14. you got a few more moments in you? He says in verse 8, The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. 
By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us, God is love. The one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Is that an amen moment? Let's stand up together, if you will. In the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, it says to us at the 9th and the 10th verses that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. I'm going to take just a moment here, and I'm going to pray. I'm going to make a declaration out loud that I do believe. And I'm going to celebrate that Jesus is Christ and Lord to me. And if you would like to join me, you are certainly welcome to do so. We can do this together. You may say, I've done that before. Well, if you've done it before, then you certainly would be glad to celebrate again. You might be in a situation where you're saying, I'm not sure I've ever done that before. I don't even know how I would qualify or if that's an appropriate thing to do. My answer to that is very simply this. Faith, as verse 17 tells us a little farther down, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, hearing by the declaration of Christ. And so we have an opportunity to believe wherever we hear the Word of God. And we've heard a good deal of God's Word today. And the God who we sometimes call the Lord, the God who appeared to Abraham and gave him a vision, the God who appeared to Moses and gave him a vision, the God who has revealed himself in so many different ways to so many different people is the one. He is our God. One. And because he is love and he has loved us, he's calling for this love from us. As we begin to believe and to grab hold of that and take a grip on it with our hearts what we want to do the thing in us that wants to answer that is to declare that Jesus is Christ and Lord and to lift my voice to testify that I do believe and so as I said I'm going to do that and you may join me if you would like to we can pray this way dear God I thank you for hearing me today I do believe in my heart that you've raised Jesus up from the dead and I proclaim with my mouth Jesus Christ is Lord I thank you Father for this new life for your love shed abroad in my heart by your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, amen. Our God is greater, our God is stronger.